Praise the Lord. I had one of those weeks. Have you ever had one of those weeks? What kind of week am I talking about? You don't even know. One of those weeks where just uh, God began to share some things with me and talk to me with different things. And, and, um, and uh, I was sitting in prayer. This was yesterday. And God says, now, to give you some background information, I started the church here 33 years ago, Key West. Well, 33 years last May. Uh, didn't know anybody, not backed by anybody. There was no, fin was no financial backing. My wife and I came down here with our family and decided to start a church with the word of the Lord saying this. When you've done all the stands, stand there if we are loins girded about with the truth. That should have been a clue. But I just said, yeah, that's, that's my word. When you've done all the stands, stand there, Lord. Be strong in the Lord. All these things we're talking about. And yes, I was in prayer, and the Lord says, he says, he says you've completed that assignment. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to be 72 in, in, in October. Does that mean I'm supposed to step aside and retire? No. He's saying, next, now we're getting ready for phase two. I just had to laugh. It was, it, was, it was hilarious the way God had presented it. He said, all those years, you, you, you stood uh, uh, 33 years. We, uh, a lot of it was standing and standing and believing for people. Of course, over those years, we've seen a lot of things happen. We've seen a lot of people delivered. We've seen a lot of people healed. And, and, and it's been a, a good run. But God's saying, no, he says, now. Uh, I, I thought I could attribute it to him leading me. A couple of weeks ago, the Lord was talking to me about strength and uh, re being renewed like the eagle. Did I just come on? Yeah. Oh, okay. Did you all get the first part of the recording? Okay. Praise the Lord. I'm gonna, okay, I'm going to start over again. Wait a minute, let me move my clock back. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Can you hear me? Yes. Could you hear me before? Yes. On the, okay, praise the Lord. Don't do that. <laughs> Where's your, I know your father. So, all right, praise the Lord. So I got, I got talking on, on strength. And, what, it, and of course, God led me to some other things. But the fact is, is... I'm going to be into, into numbers today, not the book of numbers, sure. counting, okay, counting numbers. Uh, how many has ever heard this by theologians or whatever? The amount of times you see something repeated in the word uh, is, is significant for its importance that God placed upon it. How many has ever heard that before? Okay, a couple people. Yeah, I know. I just said it in the war room. You heard it. It's now. And i got to be careful with Jason. I noticed this. I said, if I share something in the war room from my notes, that he gives it up here in the opening. <laughs> anyway, praise the Lord. But at least somebody's listening to me. Anyway, but I, uh, <laughs> so what I, a couple of weeks ago, God has been talking to me. I haven't done series in quite a while. Uh, but but and this really isn't a series. I just different topics. But God was showing me some things about strength, and we've been talking about strength. So I decided yesterday to sit down because I kept hearing this. I go into prayer and God talks about strength. He would go over and he, he kept, you know, I said, okay, another Sunday? Yeah, and, and go on. So, so this would be the third Sunday now we're talking about strength. Of course, the title of my message this morning is God's, strengthening, God's Strength Realized. I sat down and I took the words. These are the words I used from the King James Bible. Whenever I give account, I use the King James Bible. Uh, because if different translations will come up with different numbers, so I just use it for a standard. But the word strong, stronger, strength, strengthen, strengthening, strengthened. Okay, all those put together in the King James Bible add up as a form of a grand total of 591 times. 591 times those words are used in, in, in the trans King James translation. If that is an indication of any kind of importance, how many know God is into strength, Amen. not into weakness? No. If I would take the scriptures that I know about strength, as I'm going to do this morning, and just uh, basically anything that would align itself with weakness would be a path to the enemy. Amen. Now, uh, let me let me give you some of my theological background. The fact is, this is what I believe, and this is what I preach, and I believe this from the, from the get-go. But the fact is, is some people pray, and they go to God, and then they expect God to come down and do something for them. Come on, Pastor, 
But in the Bible, when you go from Genesis on through, all the way from Genesis, Moses, Joshua, I mean, you name it, all the way through the Bible, to, to Jesus and Jesus' commission, you cannot see any other uh, uh, indication where they sat back and God just did miracles in front of them. In every circumstance, in every situation, God co-labored with mankind as soon as they obeyed or did what he wanted, then the power was released. Uh, yeah, we're going to start this, this way this morning. But the fact is, is, is co-laboring is a definite possibility. So basically, uh, if, if you're not seeing God move in your lifestyle, maybe, just maybe, I'm just, you know, I'm just spitballing here, but maybe um, we're expecting God to do something and he's expecting you to do something. Not me, because I'm already doing it. No. <laughs> Just kidding. No, he expects me to do things too. So when I was sitting in prayer, and he was talking to me about the work we started here in Key West 33 years ago and different things, and he's flashed back, and I'm just thinking, well, it's an old man just reminiscing or something. He said, no. He said, I'm showing you where the, where the progressive is. He said, strength is in every one of those successes and weakness and fears in every one of those failures. So wherever we came to where it was going to fail, there was a weakness there and there was a fear. But every place we succeeded in the Lord, there was a strengthening came in. And sometimes it wasn't even, oh, I'm going to be strong in the Lord. No, 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 it wasn't that at all. I'm just going to be obedient. I don't know what he's doing, but I'm just going to be obedient. And out of obedience, God pulls strength out of us and, and, and does what he uh, is commanded to do. But in each case, it's not us just going off and doing stuff and just, well, this looks like a pretty good idea. This seems biblical. I'll just try that. No. In each case, it was when I heard from the Lord and him speaking to me and then moving out not knowing how anything is going to work out. Amen? And that was you know, to a testimony. Understand something. When we refuse fear, I wrote this out of that prayer thing. When we refuse fear, it reminds the devil that he's doomed. When we refuse fear, now fear comes as a choice. We're going to take a choice. Faith is a choice. Fear is a choice. You got a choice. God created you with a choice. You get to choose. But whatever we choose fear then we, we take the path of weakness, not strength. But whenever we, take the, whenever we refuse fear, the devil knows he's doomed right there, and he's trying to convince otherwise. Oh, this is silly. I remember when I first, we were first building the center. I shared this before, but I'll share it again for if nobody's heard it. But there was, the, I mean, oh, I, when God called me to the ministry, I wasn't, I wasn't at a sem, cemetery or a seminary. <laughs> <laughs> it was out of a cemetery or something, but not a seminary. Anyway, he, he called me out of the trades. I was an electrician. I was union electrician for a number of years. And so when we built this, when we, we, we had to remodel the building on the inside, this was an old hard, hardware store at one time. We converted into a, a church and a daycare center. I did a lot of the electrical work because it saved about $18,000 at the time uh, uh, off our church budget. So I put on the tools, and I kept on my other duties, and I did both things. So basically, I, I wired. So I used to go down to the street. There was a supply house down the street, and there was a guy behind the counter. So I would get buy the materials, you know, whether it be pipe or, or wire, whatever needed. I'd buy it off the same, same uh, supplier. And I went down there, and he, he says, he says, Are you working on that job down there? What, what used to be the, the hardware store? He said, yes, yeah, yeah, we're building that. He says, he says, really? He said, what's it going to be? I said, it's going to be a church and a daycare. Oh, that's never going to work here on Stock Island. He said, forget that. He said, you, you, you're wasting your time. I says, okay. <laughs> so I would go back the next time and buy some more supplies, and he would say, he would say he'd say, you still working? I said, yeah. I said, I says, I'm the pastor of the church there. I said, this, and he says, really? He says, you're never going to get a daycare to work on Stock Island where we're at here. You're never going to get a daycare to work. He said, it won't work. Well, then what happens, we built it up the first day, opening day, we opened the doors for the daycare, and 32 kids come in with their parents, and we had 32 kids in the room. I went down back to the supply houses. We got 32 kids. Well, well, you might get the kids, but you're not going to get the teachers. Now, there I thought he was prophesying for a time. 
What's God doing? He's listening. This, this is the weakening effect. This is the, the doubts and the unbelief. And what God was trying to do is put in the strength. Now, so what happened? Come back. Well, I had a, I had a full-time staff at that time of 11 people. Full-time, on the payroll. I went back down. I said, we got a full-time staff of 11 people. I said, we got, now we got 64 kids. I said, it grows every week. I said, then the church is trying. I said, we're just doing good. And uh, he said, well, you might do that, but it won't last. <laughs> now, this started making sense because I got this from the time I came into Key West. Forget that. I said, this might make sense. I said, I said, so what you see here this morning may not look that terrific when you compare to other bigger mega ministries, other, other places. But understand something. What you see here this morning took just as much strength and warfare to gain in this community than they did in, just as much as they did for their community. Praise the Lord. Amen. But this has discouraged many pastors because they're looking at, this, at the surface of this thing and not understanding whether that's, that's our testimony. So God brought me back to these things. He said, that assignment has been completed. When you said, I said for you to stand, when you've done all the stand, stand up for you. He said, you've completed that assignment. I said, what was that supposed to mean? He says, ready for the next. I said, now... Now I understand what the message is about. Next Octo this coming October, I'm going to be 72 years old. I'm still, I've been preaching the gospel for almost 37 years, I guess. Years. So, I, I, I'm, but I need my strength renewed like the eagles. Amen. Well, Amen. I, I, let, me, let me just share something with you because basically David said it a little bit different because what David was saying, he was saying, my youth is restored like the eagles. In Psalms 103, 5, where Isaiah 40, 31 says, your, your, your strength is renewed like the eagles. David says that quote similar to that, but he changes something. Instead of the word strength, he uses youth. My youth is restored like the eagles. I need that one right now. <laughs> I don't know how an eagle gets the strength back, but thou, I'm going with that one. David saw it too. He says, he says, for the thing, thing, next thing God has to do. And his whole, David's whole entire life was pressing forward for the next thing God wanted him to do. He went from shepherd to giant killer, from giant killer to king. I mean, from king. Then he had, to, he had some downfalls. He had made mistakes. This is, this is how it is. But, but God comes forth with strength. And what he tries to do Every place that we're seen to be failing or seen to be stagnant, he comes in with this area of strength to strengthen us back up. And I noticed something. I noticed some things I shared a little bit last week. I want to continue on this week because I saw I capitalized in two other words that go along with strength. But here's what I said last week. Um, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Help me out. Uh, when we refuse fear, it reminds the devil that he's doomed. Complaining, understand this, complaining is a language of fear. Amen. Are you out there? Yeah. <laughs> uh, praise the Lord. Got quiet. Don't <clears throat> praise the Lord. Complaining is a language of fear, and what it actually does, it actually weakens us. Now get this, complaining is actually justified. It's justifiable. When something isn't right, you can complain about it. But what, what got Israel in trouble when they're in the wilderness? Not they're wanting food, not they're wanting water, not they're wanting, uh, or were sick and tired of wandering around. It was they're complaining to God about those things that they thought they weren't being taken care of in. Amen? Amen. So praise the Lord. I just, uh, I just wanted to drop that on you to encourage you this morning. Okay, because uh, I and my wife and I, we're, we're, we're perfect. We never complain about anything. <laughs> well, there was this morning when I got up. And, and, you know, <laughs> aren't we tempted to complain about everything? I mean, we used to have a saying when I was back in the trade, you complain if you got hung with a new rope. That used to be a, that used to be a, how many remember a saying? That's an old saying, so but hung with a new rope. And I used to, I had a reply for that. So of course, the new rope chafes. Anyway, pra praise the Lord. 
Let's get to a scripture, hallelujah. Uh, uh, this is a repeat from, last, uh, from our, our previous sessions together, hallelujah. But Joshua 1.9 really stood out to me. But this is what it says. It says, I, God is saying to Joshua, and this is where Joshua is stepping in. You know the story where he steps in, takes Moses' place. Moses went to heaven. He takes it, and he lead, now he's leading that next generation into the promised uh, land of God. And God says this to him. And he says, he says, fear not, don't be afraid, don't be troubled. You know the whole thing. Uh, uh, be strong, be this, uh, you know. And now he says in, in, in Joshua 1, 9, the Lord says this, have I not commanded? Now, th- that would go along good if it was just a suggestion to, uh, 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 to be successful. So we're not suggesting this morning that this is a suggestion for you to be successful. It is uh, the pathway to success, but that's not what I'm suggesting this morning because the Lord says right here, have I not commanded you to be strong? You got that. Have I not commanded you to be strong? And the second thing he said, and of good courage, break it down into the Hebrew. Command means to appoint or charge. Have I not charged you? That's not up to debate, correct? If God was to command something, that's not up to debate. That is absolutely what we're expected to do. But the fact that he's telling Joshua to do that means it's in Joshua, it's within Joshua's capability to be strong. If that's the case, if it's in our capability to be strong, weakness must be a temptation of the enemy because he's the only one that, 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 that thrives in our weakness. So can we say that then uh, with biblical backing that God has commanded us to be strong. Anything he has us to do, we're going to need his strength. Because if we can see, and if it's so easy to do, and if ministry is so easy, everybody would be doing it. But they're not. Matter of fact, in this community, if one minister is successful in something, he doesn't get the applause from other ministers, he gets a criticism. Because it doesn't happen in our church, or whatever. I stay out of those things. Praise the Lord. I don't mess around with it because basically that too is a distraction to cause weakness. Hmm. Praise the Lord. All right, let me break down the words for you. I already did command. Command is a point or charge. The word strong means to seize or conquer. What do you think you have this morning that you need to seize or conquer? Just look around the room, huh? Uh. <laughs> the one thing you need to seize or conquer is you. <laughs> we all do, praise the Lord, so we can laugh about it. It's something, this, is, this is not something that's out there. This is something that we, we work at all the time and we continue to work at. So to seize and to conquer, be strong. To be, uh, to, to be of good courage means steadfastly minded and established. In other words, uh, as my wife often calls me, Stubborn. And she should talk. I have the Irish gene in me that makes me stubborn. Yeah, well, she's got the Dutch one in her. Uh, I rest my case. Praise the Lord. Pass the ammunition. Amen. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Amen. But be steadfastly minded and established. Here's the problem. And this is what I probably... Can I talk to all the old people this morning? I mean, older, some old as, as me, almost, and some may be older. Listen, this next generation is clueless when it comes to the things of God. Not all of them, of course, you always have the word. But we're, I see God building our strength today and rising us up for the next generation to teach them. Amen? Now, my generation, I guess, is called the baby boomers. And then, then, then there's the, uh, what you, uh, my kids were the Gen Xers, and then, of course, my grandkids were the millennials, and then, of course, their kids are, I don't know, they, get, they have all kinds of names for these generations. Uh, but anyway, but the fact is, I don't care if you're a boomer. My mom's still a great generation. She's going to be 96 next month, so praise the Lord. So, she, so she's a great generation. So... Uh, I'm sure she's looked at me several times and shaken her head and said, what did I do wrong? (laughs) I mean, I can remember specifically my one ear. If you notice, my one ear is longer than the other. That's where my mom used to grab me and drag me to church. 
kicking and screaming, you know, so not really just a, right, praise the Lord, amen. This is a fun group this morning, praise the Lord, amen. So, so God is on, on Joshua. He said, do not be afraid, again, his choice. Do not be dismayed, again, his choice. Dismayed means to be broken. Don't let the devil break you. To be dismayed means to be broken. Don't be broken. So all those things God is saying, Joshua, I put them in your, your capacity. Of course, anybody that's gone through circumstances is going to look at this and say, this is impossible. you got to be kidding me. I'm not supposed to do this. I'm not supposed to do this. No, 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 no. Get a different mindset. It's not that we're supposed to stay away from these things. It's supposed to be we're supposed to include God because we can't do this on our own. We're trying to figure out what we can do without God. Nothing. Nothing. So let's try to figure out what we're supposed to do with God. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, I'm going to leave that one alone too. Praise the Lord. I noticed in this study as I was going through, I noticed a connection. There's a connection between courage and strength, as I said in Joshua. Then I also noticed something else. There's another word here called joy. Mm, but we got to bring that one back into the church. We really do. We have to be happy we're here. We got, we got to get the joy back in. It's the fruit of the Spirit, by the way. If you have, I got the Holy Spirit. I got the Holy Spirit living within me, you know. How's the songs going? I get the Holy Spirit in me. Anyway, the fruit of that Holy Spirit in you, one of those fruits is joy, isn't it? Uh-huh. So that means you're supposed to look like you've been baptized in water, not lemon juice. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Pass the ammunition. Amen. <laughs> so, 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 so in other words, joy, and here's where we get the scripture from. Uh, Nehemiah said, the joy of the Lord is my strength. When, listen to me now. When Nehemiah said that, let's go back to the history. You remember when Israel was taken captive to Babylon and they were in captivity for 70 years. This is where Daniel wrote his prophecies. And, and of course, well, what happened was when uh, King Cyrus, God anointed King Cyrus, who was a Gentile, by the way, who went and he said, I'm, I'm going to anoint you to do one job, one job only. You go in there and you sack the Babylonian empire, but you set my people free. I'll cause you to win if you set them free. If you don't, you're not going to win at all. Cyrus says, yeah, I'll do it. So he goes in, he takes over Babylon, and basically he set the people free. He wrote his decree. And in the Persian Empire at that time, when one king wrote a decree, no other king could, could void it out. Even if, he, if that man was, was, he was in the grave, he could not be voided out because it became absolute law. So the, by the time they got to do anything with Israel, Darius was, was, was king of Persia. So we're talking a little bit. In other words, nobody was in a hurry to leave Babylon because they got comfortable. I believe the same mentality happens today where we can get comfort, comfortable in slavery. Say, so, well, oh, we're, we're free people. Sin is slavery according to the Bible. Just saying, hallelujah, and praise the Lord. So I see that the joy, but he said the joy, so when Nehemiah said that, the joy of the Lord is my strength, what happens? He's trying to rebuild the wall, and they're tearing the wall down at night, and he was setting armies up to, 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 to protect the wall they were building, and he, he got the wall built around Jerusalem. Just walk around the wall, they, the temple was there, but there's no safety without walls. So he was working on the wall. And they try to distract him from all those things. I don't teach Nehemiah, but this is where Nehemiah comes from. He said, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Now listen to me. Ezra was the priest back then. He set up a platform. And they had a big high platform. He brought all the priesthood up there. And what they did would nonstop, from morning to evening, they just read scripture. They didn't preach. They didn't elaborate. They have, people haven't heard the, the, the scriptures being read in 70 years. People are showing up with their families and their children are sitting there and they're outside and he's reading this, reading the scripture, uh, starting from Genesis, walk all the, down through the books of Moses and talking about, the, and just reading this and reading this and reading this. When he got done, they wanted to, to, to mourn, they wanted, because they, they looked at themselves, they looked at themselves as not achieving anything. Uh, we look at this, the, what have we done? Oh, my goodness, what have we done? They begin to repent, but they were sorrowful. Jer uh, Nehemiah comes and he says, no. 
He said, the joy of the Lord is your strength. In other words, grab a hold of that. In other words, at the hearing of the word, it shouldn't ignite mourning. It should ignite joy. Because God is a God of forgiveness where he wants to restore now. So what is being read, God wants to restore his temple. He wants to restore his word, if you're talking about back then. So what happens today? We hear the word of God. It should be an encouragement to us that God now wants to restore that which the devil has stolen. And we can rejoice. But there has to be the proper response to the word. And the proper response to the word is joy. That means joy is coupled with strength, and you need strength to have courage. Yes. And there's the three put together. The joy of the Lord is our strength. That's right. Yes. Praise the Lord. The joy of the Lord is our strength. That's what Nehemiah said. Amen? Mm. I was looking at David. I was, I was studying a little bit in, in, in Psalms 103, and uh, it, it, where David said, my youth is renewed like the eagles. And I noticed something. I just typed in the phrase on my search Angel, my Bible. Bless the Lord, O my soul. I hear David saying this. Bless the Lord, O my soul. I mean, you ever thought about that? Bless the Lord, O my soul. Then he goes in and says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. And he went five times in the Psalms that David wrote, he said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, until I realized what he's finally doing. Why does he keep saying, Bless the Lord, O my soul? He's talking to himself. He's talking to himself. He's commanding himself, saying, no, get over this. Amen. We're blessing the Lord. Soul? Where's our soul? Mind and intellect. Yes. Telling himself, his mind or intellect, no, we are taking this time. No, we are going to bless the Lord. Soul, bless the Lord right now. Soul, you do this right now. Yeah. Huh. Isn't that different from the other way we've been pr approaching this stuff from the soul telling us what to do? No, the spirit man rises up and tells the soul what to do. Yes. Don't think on that. You're not meditating on that today. Now, get over it. As the young people say, move on. <laughs> I, I had a little, it was a back scratcher my granddaughter gave me when she was just so high. And uh, her mom probably bought it for her to give it to her and give it to me. Anyway, it was, back, it was made out of bamboo. I like the thing. We had a little dog. And, uh, and, uh, and, and the dog chewed on the end of it. And it never did work right, you know, once the dog chewed on it. And uh, so I was, I was at my, I taught now, <laughs> fast forward to, you know, to a present time, I was telling my granddaughter about this. And, and I, I found a back scratcher that was, you know, that was um, um, telescopic. You can take it for travel, stuff like that. So I told my granddaughter, I said, I still have the one you gave me, but I had to get a new one. She said, oh, Grandpa, move on. <laughs> well, I couldn't move on. It meant something to me because my granddaughter gave it to me. You know, say, so she said, "Oh, Grandpa, move on." She says, and uh, praise the Lord. My mom used to say, "What was good for that back scratching?" Uh, she used to say, "Soap and water." <laughs> that wasn't the problem. Hallelujah, Amen. Anyway, uh, uh, where, where did I leave off? <laughs> so. Joy is now mixed in because what happens, let me go back to what I, what I originally said. I, I said this in, in previous sessions. There's a connection between courage uh, and s strength and joy. There's a connection there, strength, courage, and joy. We're trying to be tough on our own, strong. I'm going to be strong and I'm going to be stubborn on my own. But how many know that eventually the mind's going to win out unless you fix it? The renewed mind that Jesus has given us, see, Christians have access to what's called a renewed mind. Hmm. I said, Christians have access to what's called the renewed mind. Amen. So what happens is there's two mindsets that are at war with you right now if you're a Christian. The mindset you know, which you had and grew up with and, and, and were born with, and the mindset that Jesus is changing and transforming your thoughts. And those two things are at war with each other. Praise the Lord. Why? Because basically what we think is going to be carnal. How many know, how many brought up in religion? You know what? Religion is one of the biggest disappointments uh, in, in the world. Because relig Jesus never acquainted religion to the Father. Do you notice that? Matter of fact, he it was the enemy. Uh, the, the biggest attack that Jesus had against his ministry when he was here on the earth was religious, was a religious spirit from the Pharisees and from the scribes. Did you know that? 
Amen. He never, it never was, it, it, it was always a tool of the enemy. Because religion, what happens, religion will tell you you do this, this, and this, and this, and you can become perfect. And then what happens is when you try those things, you become disappointed because you're just an old, you're just the same old person with new habits. But now if what happens, if it succeeds for you to where you feel better about yourself, then you move into the area of pride. So religion has those two aspects. Either you're going to be disappointed with, it, with, it, with the results or you're going to be prideful of the results. Either one is going to be man's efforts and not God coming in and renewing. So the strength I'm talking about this morning is not your ability and what you can do necessarily, but in what you need to tap into that spiritual and pull it into your, in, into your life uh, uh, right there. Praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. So I said this in connection. Uh, there's a connection between courage, strength, and joy. All three are founded in the presence of God. Let me make sure we're talking about the right thing. The strength that I'm talking about this morning is a found in the presence of God. It's found in his word, but it's found in his presence. Guess let's get that straight. Because what happens, we need courage to face the battle, strength to win the battle, and joy to seal the victory of the battle. Joy becomes a faith victory. How many know you have a faith victory before you have an actual victory? In other words, you can see it with the eye of faith. You believe that with the eye of faith, and then it happens. Now you have the manifested victory. Joy and being joyful before you see the manifestation happen is where we need to be. Now, we, I see it with my eyes. I can see this church. I can see this going. I can see the ministry going. Here. Yeah, I can see this. I can see this. Joy. Because if we're looking at what God is about to do, we have no other reaction. We have no other feeling but joy. And that joy builds a strength within us. You're not going to convince us otherwise. And it builds a courage to get anything done that we need to do to be the process of that thing. Then I found one more. I thought I was satisfied with that. I found one more. This one you got to listen to a little bit carefully because this is what Jesus was saying. Amen? But he put in, a, he put in something else. See, understand something about joy before I move into the other one. Joy, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Joy is a priceless, priceless commodity in heaven. Don't ever misunderstand it. It's a priceless commodity. Because Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says this, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despite the shame and sat down at the right hand of the Father. In other words, because of joy and what joy brought to the Father and the joy of heaven, Jesus was willing to go to the cross. He was willing to go to the whipping post. He was willing to be tortured in that Roman torture chamber uh, situation, whatever it is. He was willing to go through that because he didn't, he saw the pain, he saw the, 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 the despair. Can you imagine what his body endured when the sins and the curses of the entire world were dumped upon him? Jesus didn't resurrect himself. The Father had to resurrect him. Jesus was dead. And the Father spoke resurrection. He became the life and left all that junk in hell where it belongs. Then he ascended to the Father, set on the right hand. Why did he do that? He did all of that for joy. It wasn't joyful going to a crucifixion. It wasn't joyful. We have incidents. They may not be joyful. But can we see the joy once we complete something that God has given us and once we've labored through those things, can we see the joy beyond that? Amen. That's where the Father rejoices. He's not rejoicing for your suffering now. He's rejoicing because he's going to bring you through it. Amen. He's rejoicing at the other end. You've got to see his forthcoming. Forth joy is a precious, precious commodity in heaven. God thinks a lot of joy. The Father sent his own son to crucifixion for the joy that was on the other side of that crucifixion. And the joy that was on the other side of that crucifixion was you and I. Amen. He put his son aside for you and I. Amen. Well, I, got, I don't have time to preach any further on that, but praise the Lord. Amen. Then Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 24, he says, until now, he's talking to his disciples, until now, You've asked nothing in my name until now. That means something's about to change. Then Jesus says this one word. He says, ask, call for, crave, desire, ask. 
that you will receive that your joy, delight, cheerfulness may be full, complete. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Ask that your joy may be full. Hmm. Joy must be full. Four times in the book of, in book of John, chapter 14, 15, and 16, Jesus is asking me anything, I'll give it to you. Jesus is wanting to draw us into a relational encounter where we are asking according to our, our understanding of his nature and his covenant. Now, the next thing, praise the Lord. Amen. He's about to go to the cross, and he looks at Peter, and he says, I'm going to leave soon. Peter says, wherever you go, I'm going. You know how they talk. Amen. Praise the Lord. Jesus says, you're going to deny me before the cock even crows three times. He says, you'll deny me. And um, Peter says, no, I never, of course, we knew that would happen. Jesus knew it was going to happen before it happened. Are you following me? And he said this to Peter, and this was an assignment. You can take this as an assignment. Peter's assignment was, but I have prayed for you that your faith faileth not. Jesus and saying to Peter, I prayed for you that your faith faileth not. That, not, that your faith will not fail. Now listen, when you return to me, strengthen your brethren. Peter's assignment, at the time of the crucifixion, the weakest disciple, the only one that's recorded that denied Jesus, uh, denied his resurrection, was Peter. The next time you say, well, God wouldn't choose me for that. Peter could have chimed in and said the same thing. Why would God choose me to strengthen the brethren? If I got to strengthen the brethren, that means I got to encourage them. Oh, what does the word strengthen mean here? Oh, in the Greek, what does it mean? It means to set fast, to turn uh, uh, resolutely in a certain direction, to redefine their direction. The guy who denied Christ at the crucifixion is now picked by God to change the direction. Hey, that's nothing. What about Paul, who was used to be Saul, persecuted the church, took the most murderous guy that, 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 that was killing Christians. He says, now you're going to be the chief one, used in the right two-thirds of the New Testament. What, what's your point, Pastor? My point is we can't dismiss ourselves because of what we see in ourselves. The only thing a lot of times we see in ourselves is what the devil wants known and not what God wants to know. So we have to see something else that God sees that we don't see. This is pretty good. I think I'll get the tape and listen to it again. <laughs> tape? We don't use tape anymore. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen? Now, maybe this makes better sense after saying that. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. As long as Christ's strength is there, the all things he's talking about is what the Father has intended for me to do, and I can get it done. Not because of my strength, but because of what God has placed in me. Are you here? Amen. Praise the Lord. Good. I said all that to bring you to Isaiah chapter 35. <laughs> Are you, are you ready? This is going to blow your socks off. You got your best argyles on? Isaiah 35 and verse 3 says this. It says, strengthen. Is that word again? One of the 591 words. Praise the Lord. Uh, times, strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. This is what the prophet's saying. Say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong and do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with recompense. That's divine retribution. Recompense of God. He will come and save you. Listen, verse 5. If you're there, verse 5, underline the next word. The next word is then. Okay, can I stop right there for a minute? He's saying all this here, strengthen the hands, strengthen the weak knees, strengthen it, strengthen, strengthen, strengthen. Then, everybody say then. Then, then, then. the next thing is going to happen. But it won't happen until we strengthen this, 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 this. Then God will come with vengeance 
and then this is what's going to happen. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped, then the lame shall leap like deer, and the tongue of the dumb shall sing, for the waters will burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. When we strengthen somebody else, what was Peter's assignment? Peter didn't feel strong. Matter of fact, when Pete, Jesus first met Peter, he said, Peter, he says, uh, follow me, I'll make you a fisher of men. Right? Yeah. Changed his direction and destiny. How many would agree with that? Yeah. That statement changed his direction and destiny. So what happens? Now he's disturbed. Jesus left. Jesus crucified. What's Peter do next? Right back to the old stuff. Right back to fishing. So when he sees Jesus, he sees Jesus on the bank with a fire going and says, children, do you have any meat? And you thought fish wasn't a meat. You were told that's what you could eat on Fridays. <laughs> it's meat. It ain't a plant. <laughs> Amen. And Peter looks, he sees Jesus on the shore. He puts on his clothes because what they would do in work, they would take off their outer garments because garments were expensive. You didn't want to wear them out. But to be present on the shore, be present in town, you got to be dressed. So he put on his clothes, jumps into the water, which makes him all wet. Like a big old sloppy, wet Labrador retriever goes up and gives Jesus a big hug. Jesus was changed at that point. Our Peter was changed at that point to seeing Jesus. Amen? First, strengthen the weak hands before this or any other ministry can go forth. It has to strengthen what God has placed in it. We strengthen our hands in these things. Now, let's go lay hands on the blind. Now, then it will happen. I'll read it again. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. That means people have a hard job standing. Okay, metaphorically, this is a prophetic uh, uh, metaphor. People that are wishy-washy, uh, uh, we would say it that way. People, well, you know, they're for Jesus one minute and then they take it off doing something else the next minute and back and forth, back and forth, weak knees. It also talks about the lame, physical. It also does, but there's spiritual things that are attached. Prophets always speak in both, both uh, um, existences. <laughs> Amen. But anyway, it says, okay, he says, uh, he, says, he says, strengthen the weak hands, make firm the feeble knees, say to those who are fearful at heart, be strong and do not fear. How can you say that? I can tell anybody in here, be strong and do not fear. Yeah, 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 but you never went through what I'm going through. Yeah, 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 I know, preachers all, all, all the same. They're all the same, they're all the same, telling you to have faith and give me your money. I don't know the circles you hang around, but praise the Lord, amen? Amen? Hmm. I thought the two were connected, but, you know, some people just do what they want to do. Amen? And guess what will happen? And guess what will change in your life? Absolutely nothing. Because you are making excuses for your fear. Absolutely nothing. You are beholding to one person and one person only. And it's not the preachers. It's not the hierarchy. It is Jesus himself. Amen. We started with water baptism. You heard me share this before. Some people say, well, do I really need to get baptized? I don't know. Did Jesus need to get baptized? <laughs> but he did. <laughs> Amen. So that's my answer to do I need? Do I really need to do all this stuff? You don't need to do anything. You don't need to do anything about your salvation. You can go straight to hell if you want to. It's your right. I'm not saying that facetiously. I'm saying that's the truth. God has given you a free will. You can do that if you want to. Stupid if you do. That's my <laughs> Stupid if you do when God answers all this. He said, but come on, let's strengthen the weak hands and the feeble knees. Then, then the eyes of the blind shall open. Then the deaf ears. In other words, God is requiring strength for miracles to happen. God is, we're trying to humble ourselves in some kind of a weakness to get self out of the way. And God is trying to co-labor with that self that we're trying to get out of the way. Do you, see, do you see the conflict here? Hmm. Oh, I wish I had more time. Praise the Lord. Amen. 
Now, I got to finish up with this. I got eight seconds to do it. Probably not going to happen, but bear with me. God has given us the fourth thing, desire. Now, before you start mindset, well, I desire this and I desire that. You better hear me out. You better hear what Jesus had to say first. Amen? Number one, we have a God-given ability to desire. Jesus gave us that. The problem being is it can be easily perverted with carnal, carnal desires for wrong things and common problems. I understand that completely. Amen? Number two, our desire becomes the offspring of our relationship with God. And number three, desire becomes a catalyst that em to embrace the battle. Now let me read the first scripture in that. Amen. The Lord built us, uh, uh, another phrase I'll put down, the Lord built in us a capacity to receive his answers to our prayers. I mean, he gives us that capacity. John chapter 15 and verse 7, Jesus says, if, now how many know the word if is conditional? That's based on a condition. If you abide in me and my words abide in you. Let me start off in the beginning. If you abide in me, that's a felt realization of his presence. And my words abide in you. That's the intentional embrace of what he has spoken into our life. You got those things down? Okay, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, you will ask what you desire. Ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Because if you have the felt realization of his presence and the intentional embracing of what is said for his life, the things that you desire and the things that God desires will be the same. So it's not a line. He said, I, and when that happens, I will give you. You have to abide in me. But I will give you those desires. Because now they're not just the Father's desires. Those desires will become our desires. Jesus and I can, can agree on one thing. We both hate the devil. Amen. Now, how are you gonna, what are you going to do to carry it out? You can't flirt with him one minute and hate him the next minute. You can't love one attribute of the devil over here and then despise him over here. I don't work that way. Well, I used to say it this way. Love what God loves and hate what he hates. And you'll, be, you'll do all right. Amen. Praise the Lord. Jesus has actually given us permission to desire. That's a fact. In context of staying connected to his presence and valuing everything he has to say to us, it is then our desire becomes a manifestation of his nature and his covenant. Yeah, hey, now we're hitting to the thing, we're hitting to the right, right cause. We are designed to co-labor with him. Proverbs 13, 12, you all know this one. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but desire fulfilled is a tree of life. How many know what that tree of life means? We have, we have two trees in the garden, one was a tree of knowledge, one was a tree of life. So he says tree of life. We read over this stuff, but we stop and think what it means. The tree of life is this. It helps us define our eternal purpose. Just like the tree of life in the garden was to define their eternal purpose until they went to the tree of knowledge. They went to the other tree that they weren't supposed to touch. I'm talking about Adam and Eve now. Amen? So the tree of knowledge. Let me read that again. Proverbs 13, 12. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but desire, now the, in the Hebrew that word means longings of one's heart and delight. But desire fulfilled, that thing fulfilled, is a tree of life, helps define our eternal purpose. Now here's the thing about desire. Um, uh, Maria should probably appreciate this. I looked up the word desire in the Bible. The old, I told you I was going to get into numbers this morning. Okay, in the King James Bible, there are 15 different words from the Greek that mean desire. 15 different words in the Greek that are all translated to one word, desire, in the English. So this one that I'm talking about, okay, oh, let me finish my, my statement. There are 22 different words in the Hebrew Old Testament for the word desire. Both of them are pretty close in the same definition, but what we're talking about here, when I'm talking about uh, desire, this desire in Proverbs 13, 12 is a longing of one heart or delight. So it's the same word delight in the Hebrew. 
in, in Jesus, what Jesus was saying, he used the word desire, it says to be resolved or determined to purpose. <laughs> the Greek word here in, in, in John 15, 7, what Jesus was saying, you des whatever you desire, I it will be done for you. That word desire is to be resolved or determined to purpose. Hmm. Are we getting anything out of this message this morning? Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop right there. I'm going to... I'm going to go. I'm, I'm out of time. My phone just went dark, so I'm out of time. It means I'm out of time. But praise the Lord. How many got something this morning? I'm going to probably continue on. Um, uh, what I want. Praise the Lord. What I wanted to emphasize this morning is our responsibility to a gospel, what Jesus has said, to not just tend to ourselves, but we are actually here to help strengthen other people. Okay, we strengthen the feeble hands, we strengthen the feeble knees, and then once we, we speak strength over those things, once that happens, then God comes in, heals the blind, heals the lame, heals me. So what happens is a strength in God actually brings forth the miraculous realm everybody's looking for and needing. Amen. Amen. But it's a strength in God. I uh, over prepared again, I can tell you, because there's so much my, things going on in my brain right now. I just, just burn them all out, but we'll be here the next Tuesday. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I want, you to, I want our, this church to have a good understanding. Anybody who's watching, I want to have a good understanding this day and hour that we live in. God is, is, is magnifying strength. Every excuse that we come up with, I'm including myself in it, every excuse that we come up with that sidetracks us from what God has called us is a sign of weakness, not a sign of strength, and it's not a pass. Because you can say all the things you want to say, in the contrary, God will still come back and say, what about this? I didn't get into Gideon, but if you want to read, if you want to read ahead for next week, uh, uh, Gideon chapter 6, Gideon come up with all the reasons why he shouldn't be doing what he's doing or what God's asking him to do. And God ignored all of that and went right to the point. <laughs> I'll get into it next week. Amen. Because basically God has given the responsibility of being strengthened on us. And not only on us, us to help. So when you've been strengthened, help give it away to somebody else and strengthen somebody else. Amen. So I pray this morning that all the things that we were said here and all the, all the message that went forth will be a strengthening to your spiritual life. Amen? Amen? Now that you have an understanding of some of the things. But you, you have to move the understanding, which is from the brain, from the soulish realm, move the understanding from your brain to your heart. Don't understand it in the head because it all makes sense. I can make, tell you it makes sense in the head. Uh, move it from your understanding in the head. Move it to your heart. That's what we're going to do. Amen. And there's where the courage comes in. Amen. Yes, I'm going to face the battle. Whatever, whatever it takes, I'm going to do it. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, let's stand to our feet. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, for that extra time. But uh, Wow. <laughs> I'm preparing four pages of notes like I normally do, but I'm only getting like two of them. <laughs> that, I, I usually take that as indication. It, it, it's interesting all the way through. That I usually take that as indication. This is, this is a subject God wants us to rest on for a little bit anyway but I'm going to do that. Amen. Praise the Lord. I believe it's the most important thing that I have taught this year so far. I believe it. I believe this season we need, we need to hear this stuff. We really do. And so I want to do whatever I can as a pastor and a minister of God to help your feeble knees or your weak hands. Amen. Now, I, I say that metaphorically in, in the, so he can bring in the physical healing that we desire. But you see what happens. It kind of happens with other people believing in the spiritual realm and then God brings it to pass in the physical. Praise God. Amen. Hmm, that's something. Amen. In other words, we acknowledge it with our knower, and then God can move for the rest of it with our faith. So that's why I said, whatever you've got the understanding for today, let's drive that understanding down into our heart. Follow God with your heart. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, I mean, I can give you all kinds of facts and information to make you smart, but 
without Christ, without coming out of our heart, what good is it? Really, what good is it? Amen? So hear the word. Let's hear it. Father, we thank you for your word this morning in the name of Jesus. I think we, th you, you are giving us a word that we all need to pay attention to in this hour. I believe this is seasonal. This is for this season. This word that went forth today is not just timely, but this is the present word of the Lord this morning. And we put it together the best way we could with the, using your scripture, Lord. I, I pray the supernatural is up to you. Lord, the supernatural, touch every heart in here and let them see themselves strong, not see themselves for what they see or what they've been or for what they've done, but let them see themselves for what you see and have, you have an eye on, their, on our future. And Lord, in the name of Jesus, never in a million years, I'll tell you, church, never in a million years did I ever think I was going to be a pastor. Matter of fact, I was 18 years old when I left home. I went to a, a year of tech school and then four years of apprenticeship program in the union. I got married, Diane and I got married. I was, I was just a youngster, just, we were just teenagers when we got married. Had two kids and, and you now grandchildren. And I told my mother, I says, okay, you dragged me to church all my life. And so I'm, 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 out of, I'm not living. See, under, in, in my family, my dad and my mom, you live under the roof, you live by the rules. You don't have, you want your own life, get your own place. So he used to tell you. You want, you want to live the life you want to live? Good, get out. I mean, that's, that's what parenting was back, you know. Hallelujah. I said, I'm never going to return to church again. And then God says, ha, ha, ha. You, know, you have no idea. I, if you put four people in the room, I couldn't talk without stuttering. God says, the problem with you, he says, you're too concerned about what other people think of you and not enough concern about what I think. Get my opinion in there. And that one revelation made an instant preacher. Why? Because God had worked me to do it. From there, went to the mission field around the world, different things like that. Thank you, Jesus. Amen? Amen. How many feel stronger already? Yeah. Come on. How many feel... How many feel bold? All right. You heard it here. I did my job. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 4. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. Amen. Works out there. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Let's get busy because we've got an island that's on the way to hell. <laughs> let's, uh, let's, uh, let's go out and, and uh, strengthen some, some hands and some feeble knees and watch God do the rest of the miracles. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Bless these people. We walk with your blessing in the name of Jesus. We give you the praise. And where's that joy again? What's that? That joy, right? The joy of the Lord is my strength. You need that joy of the Lord when you can't think of anything to be joyful over. He will. He will. He will. He'll think of something. You can't, you can't, I mean, you can't be joyful because you're trying to be happy. Happy is a condition of mind. Joyful is a condition of heart, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You've heard me say that about a thousand times. All right. Praise the Lord. I'm done preaching. Go home. <laughs> <laughs>